So today we're going to be showing you two dishes that are meant to be shared and celebrated at the holidays. I'm going to be doing a beef shin and oxtail ragu with rosemary pappardelle. And I'll be doing a haunch of lamb with anchovy butter, some broad beans and mint. So head to the Tasty Sydney website to grab the recipes. Welcome to the Taste Dining at Home series presented by Diners Club. I'm your host for the series, Alice Zaslavsky, and it brings me so much pleasure and festive joy to bring you our very last episode. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm coming to you from, the Boon Wurrung people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Our chefs today come to you with quite the pedigree. Danielle Alvarez has spent time in the kitchens at the French Laundry, as well as time with Alice, Alice Waters uh, at Chez Panisse. And our chef, Nick Hill, has spent time at the Ledbury, Sepia and Key. And both chefs today are young, fresh faces that have really interesting approaches to food. And I'm really excited to speak about your two dishes because what I love most about the cuts of meat that you've chosen are that they're secondary cuts, which a lot of people are discovering and having a lot of fun with. So Danielle, you chose oxtail uh, and beef shin. Was it an easy choice for you when you're slow cooking like that? Well, when slow cooking, I always want to use cuts like that. Um, they're certainly the best. And for me, there's nothing that screams more family and getting together for a big meal than a big plate of pasta. So that is the inspiration for the dish. It's certainly something I would serve. Um, even if it was summer months, I still think it's something really festive and delicious that everyone can get into. Mm, and I love, we'll chat a little bit more about the pasta a bit later, but I love the addition of the rosemary through the papadelli. Yeah. And I think uh, that's something that if you want to try it at home, the recipe is available from the Taste of Sydney website. So do check it out. And another recipe that you'll find there is the haunch of lamb from Nick. Now, I've never done a lamb haunch. So why don't you talk us through what you did and why? Um, well, I suppose lamb haunch is essentially just like leg of lamb, you know, and people sort of just roast it whole or, you know, boneless. Um, and it's just a way of breaking down the lamb to sort of, I guess, get a more tender cut. Um, it's something used in restaurants quite a bit to use up lambs. When you get a whole lamb, you know, we sort of used to use the A-grade cuts on, on the expensive dinner menu and the lunch menu would get the leg. Um, but it's not to say it's not, uh, um, you know, the same sort of quality meat um, and quality cut. So, yeah, we just take a seam out the the leg um into the haunch into little uh individual muscles and, and barbecue it and it's just a really good way to eat lamb i think a bit cheaper mm -hmm. too yeah and if we were wanting to do this with just like a straight up leg of lamb for the festive season and use that anchovy butter i love anchovy with lamb how long would we be cooking that lamb leg for um i mean it does depend on the piece that you use from um from the haunch um but it's sort of i mean even for the filming we cooked a little piece for about five or six minutes and then just a good hard rest you know the resting's important especially for a cut like that um and rest it for about the same time we cooked it um so you know it's, it's not like a daunting piece where we think oh, i've got to roast a whole leg of lamb for the family and be here forever you cut into the individual muscles you can barbecue it pretty quick flash it in the oven and, and off you go you know yeah you could always butterfly it as well that um yeah you know, totally you want to join it you know take it to all the different muscle groups and so butterflying yeah. a leg of lamb halves the cooking time doesn't it absolutely i um it's actually mm -hmm. I cook that at home quite a lot. Um, that's sort of my wife's number one request is butterfly leg of lamb. And just sort of lay the whole thing out, put it straight onto the grill. And it's, yeah, it's kind of like 20 minutes where to go, really. It's pretty quick. You just kind of nail it and rest it. And, and it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Mm. And on the flip side, Danielle, you know, beef, shin, oxtail, all of those secondary cuts, they're all about low and slow. So how long are we cooking those cuts of meat for? So those cook for about like two hours, two to three hours, depending. Um, definitely meat on the bone takes a little bit longer than something off the bone. But you could also use like the short ribs if you wanted, like really any kind of on the bone cut that loves, like I said, a long, slow cook would be excellent in there. Yum. And because they're such rich meats, um, obviously you're thinking about acid because yes. I was looking for a segue. You're yes. all about adding <laughs> <laughs> little bits. So, you know, Always Add a Lemon is your new book. Have you got yes. a recipe like that in the book? 
I do actually. So it's similar to um, a braise that I have in the book that I use vinegar in it actually to braise the meat at the beginning. Vinegar, a bit of red wine as well. But both of those things really help break down all of that um, fatty, rich, gelatinous that meat that makes a beautiful sauce that coats the pasta, but it definitely helps to cut through so it's not just rich on rich. Mm. And for people that watch the video and think, oh, that looks a bit daunting to be making my own noodles, um, tell us how easy it is to actually make your own pasta. Well, I think you're right. It is one of those things that people think, oh, it's just easier if I get it from the shop. But really, if you, you're you just mixing together eggs and a bit of flour, and the addition that I put in the recipe for you all is a little bit of chopped rosemary, fresh rosemary, which just gives a really beautiful perfume to the whole dish. Um, and mixing it and then letting it rest and running it through a pasta machine. So, th so that is a bit of equipment that you need to be able to do that. But I think it's so much fun and it's a great thing to do to get other people involved and kids, if you have kids. It could be a fun little festive holiday activity to make that pasta together as a family. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And Nick, speaking of fun festive holiday activities, it is broad bean season here in Australia and you've got broad beans as part of the dish. Um, are you a double potter? Yeah, <laughs> yes and no. That's a good question. Yes and no. Depends how fiddly it gets. Um, look, when the season's right, I sort of don't bother. You know, at the start of the season when it's all fresh and everything's looking good, I just, um, I generally just, uh, just pod once, to be honest. Um, but uh, when when things get a little bit starchy, then I, uh, I blanch and double pod. Mm. Yeah. So um, is there like a general rule of thumb, pun intended, for the size of the broad bean before you start yeah, double that's potting? Yeah, that's right. That's probably a good one. Let's go with thumb. I'll, I'll run with that. That sounds good. Yeah, if it's bigger than your thumb <laughs> and it tastes like chalk, then you've got to boil it. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, otherwise you're good to go. Mm. And are you using those, uh, the actual be broad bean pods or the, the sheaths for any, any purpose? No, I've, I've eaten them before, actually. I've been to places that sort of grill them whole. Um, and mm. it's still, but, I mean, not for this particular recipe, no. no. And this particular recipe, I think, aside from the lamb, the hero really is the creamy goat's cheese as well with the broad bean. A lot yeah. of people would be hesitant, you know, putting a rich meat like lamb with something sort of cheesy as well um prove us wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, look i think it, it kind of works pretty well I, I always like the um that sort of like lamb and goat's cheese is quite salty and i guess you got anchovy in there as well so it's like you know it's not taking any prisoners this one but um mm. i think that the goat's cheese with the broad beans you know if you do get sort of little waxy ones or anything it just, just makes it really nice and sort of creamy and rounds it all out pretty well um mm. you know if you're not a goat's cheese person you can even use ricotta um, lots of pecorino in there as well. So like it needs a bit of, bit of lift, a bit of help. Broad beans are great, but they only bring so much to the party. So hence the, the creamy sort of back it up to a bit, you know, a bit of that, bit of help, bit of richness. Love it. And if broad beans aren't in season, what are we using? Um, look, you can use peas really, even a handful of frozen peas if you're really not feeling it. It's a good way, it's a good way to go for it, you know. Um, mm chopped up snow peas, snap peas and peas all mixed together are blanched with mint and goat's cheese is also lovely. Um, I think just when broad beans are in, they've got that texture that, you know, the other sort of, the others don't really possess. So, so broad beans if you got them, but yeah, look, frozen peas work. I won't lie. Yum. And Danielle, you know, <laughs> we've talked a lot about flavours with Nick. You know, you are the flavour queen and Nigella Lawson herself said that, you know, that her flavours in this book, always add a lemon, have inspired her. Um, so, when you're putting flavours together, like the rosemary with the beef, um, have you got other classic flavour combinations? So for you, what would you put lamb with? Um, definitely lamb with mint. That's one of my favourite ones. Um, I also love uh, marinating lamb with a bit of rosemary, thyme and garlic. Um, and then I'll blend that up in a blender with a little bit of olive oil and spread that over the lamb. And that's something we do a lot at the restaurant with cuts that we're going to grill. So your racks of lamb, your leg of lamb, butterfly leg of lamb. I know you were talking about that. Um, but that is, those are cuts that to me love a little bit of a marinade and, and those are the herbs that I like to use there. 
Mm. And you're taking a little bit of a break over the uh, festive season, but then you're back in the restaurant at Fred's. What can we expect to see for Fred's in 2021? Well, I think just more of the same. I, I feel like, you know, we've I, we've been there over four years, so I think we've really found a good place to be. Um, we've started doing some extra lunches during the week, which I think with more and more people working from home, they're able to come to a suburban neighborhood to enjoy that. Um, and our breakfast on Saturday mornings continues to grow. It started off as just a little offering of pastries and um, dinner pickups for people to come in on Saturday morning. And now we're at the point where you just can't, there's no seats, people are queuing out the front, which is excellent. Um, so we'll see how much more creative we can be and, and more inclusive. I think Fred's is a beautiful, incredible restaurant and I want more and more people to be able to go um, and not just feel like it's a place that you go for a special occasion. Mm, that's awesome. And Nick, for you, 2021 sees, you know, branching out into something beyond the walls of a restaurant. Smoked eel is hot, so hot right now. Um, and you <laughs> it always. So you are uh, making a foray into that, that part of your, uh, your business, I suppose. Um, what inspired you to get that way inclined? Um, well, actually, I um I got asked to do a TV spot, and I did a show with um with uh, cooking with ET, and, and and a bunch of my mates who were chefs had done it, and they got on mm -hmm. to the Barrier Reef and all these places cooking, you know, fishing for coral trout and doing all this amazing, you know, tropical fishing, and then I was um up in the Hawkesbury trapping eels in the dark in mud in the winter, so I just tried to take, take the best out of that <laughs> one, and uh, and I just <laughs> formed a relationship with the um with the fishermen. Uh, who's a young bloke who lives on the river um and we basically originally were going to do it and just make our own smoke deals for the pub and just sell them across the across the bar and, and that sort of thing and mm. and then COVID hit and there was no more pub so we kind of just had a lot of eels that we were sitting on and thought right we need to do something with this and we had formed the relationship and had all the infrastructure to do it so therefore we decided to sort of make it a business really make it retail and and then figure out a good way to do it so we launched in july um during mm. COVID. Um, and it's been really well received. We're in, you know, a lot of top restaurants um, in the city. A lot of people have really enjoyed what we do, and and it's been received a lot better than I thought. You know, I think the stigma is jelly deal, as people freak out about, but everyone mm. either side of that seems to really mm. enjoy it. Um, yeah. Well, so is it just for wholesale, or can we find this in retail wholesale, as well? Wholesale and retail. Yeah. So retail, we're at um, LPs in Chippendale. We're at uh, Continental in Newtown um fabrica in the city um and p and v in newtown they sell a lot of it so we have a line of um pieces of whole eel and we also make a smoked eel pate which you can find at fred's mm. bar downstairs um uh, actually yeah. um which down at, uh, <laughs> down at charlie parker's they're, they're serving it there as well um yep. and we love it we love it Oh, good, good. What do you love about it, Danielle? Because it's one thing for Nick to be like, yeah, I love my eel. But um, you're obviously someone that's, you know, putting putting her money where her mouth is. So, so what, are people, what are you loving about it and what are, what are um, customers loving about the smoked eel pate? I think that, like, smoky flavour mixed with, like, I've always loved had a thing for, like, a smoked fish dip. I think as a kid that was something that we had really quite often. Um, mm. But it's almost like, you know, the bacon of the sea i guess and who doesn't love that like it's the smoky flavor and we put it on a little toast with some pickles like it's a perfect thing to start off with um so nick's got an yeah. incredible product thank you very much mm, that's good. so good so can yeah. you buy that smoked peel pate as well you know retail facing and when yeah. can we get it in victoria <laughs> well victoria is next on the map we, we, look, to, we right. look for distribution north and south we've got customers people asking up in Brunswick and um and as far as Brizzy. Um and then we're looking for distribution to Melbourne as well, sort of early to mid next year. Um there's a few few down in Melbourne are asking already, so it's coming. It's coming. Terrific. And, uh, and so what should we be looking for? What's the what's the brand called? Called Smoke Trap Eels. Um, there it is. So, there you go. Nice. <laughs> so this, is actually, um, this is actually something we're launching in 2021. This is a, a dashi vinegar. So we, we have a few, we don't really have any byproduct of the, of the eel now we did. We, uh, so we sell whole eels and then 
from the pate, all the bones and everything that's left over, we grind that down into a mince, dry it back out in the smoker, and then we put that into yeah. Japanese sushi vinegar to make a dashi vinegar from smoked eel. So um, we've got about four, to, we've got about 500 litres of this uh, on the crackle for next year, um, which is going to be a lot of bottling. So that's pretty much what I'm doing in January, I think. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it'll, it's available um, early next year. So that's our third that's, product. That's brilliant. Yeah, and you know, yeah. I'm so glad. You know, I, I think um, if there's one thing that has happened through 2020 is that a lot of people have somehow found what it is that they probably should have been doing all along. The way that you speak so passionately about uh, your product and this exciting new um, dashi vinegar that is like speaking to to my hipster food niche heart like yeah. hard. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll try it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Get it yep. to Vic, please. <laughs> and and <laughs> so Danielle, for you, obviously, um, you've got the book and, and you've got Fred's opening. Um, and I've I've noticed that you're doing a little bit more pieces to camera. Can we expect to see you on our screen yes. more often in 2021? <laughs> Well, um, I think you will see me a little bit more. Um, I just filmed a couple episodes with um, Adam Leo for a new cooking show that he has coming up on SBS. Um, I think I can talk about that. <laughs> um, totally. he's got some <laughs> yeah, I think um, he's got a couple of great people coming up there. And we'll see. There's a couple of projects that are not confirmed, so I can't say, but potentially mm. a bit more. It's something that I'm not super comfortable with, but I actually really enjoy it when I'm doing it. So, um, and I think it, the, the response is great. I think people love seeing food made in action. You know, it's one thing to read a recipe, but they love to see how you do it. So um, I'd love to do a bit more. That's awesome. And you've got that beautiful warmth on camera. So I'm really, really happy to know that you'll be on our screens Aww. more often. So uh, speaking of our screens, Thank it's you, time Sophie. for some audience <laughs> participation. Thank you. Um, so let's go to some audience questions that have been submitted for Danielle and for Nick. So the first question is for both of you, what do you both love to cook? Uh, what do you both love about the holidays? Let's start there. Nice and general. Nick? <laughs> um. Everything. I'm a sucker, actually. I've just um, recently put up a thousand lights in a very small room in an eight foot tree. Um, Love it. And I've just got like, I've got a six kilo ham coming next week. So like, I'm all about it. I, like eat ham for a month. I watch one Christmas movie every night for a month. Um, Have you got a fave? The... What's your favorite uh, Christmas movie? A Home Alone 1 has to be. A Home Alone 1 and 2. And then, <laughs> yeah. Firstly about Die Fine Hard. Choices. Die Hard's not, it's not, it's not as good. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Bad boy. Yeah. And yeah, Danielle, what about what about you? What do you love about the holidays? Probably that you get a little break this time. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think so. I think it's just the the pause. Although it's pretty quick because um, we're not closed very much at the restaurant. But you know, I, I do. For the past few years, have been able to get home, and this year is a little bit different. But I still just love that it's a moment for everyone to stop, take a breath, uh, have some time at the beach, mostly in Australia, or just to hang out with friends and family. I think we're still very fortunate to be able to do that. So, you know, it's all about getting together, eating good food, mm -hmm. drinking some nice wine, and just relaxing and, and reconnecting mm -hmm. after a really busy lead up. Yep, and watching many, many Christmas movies while we tuck That's into right. our six kilo ham. I love it. Yeah. Next question, please. <laughs> Roll it up. <laughs> what are your tips for cooking for a group over the holidays? So, Nick, I'm assuming that six kilo ham is for yourself. <laughs> yeah, my wife get might, might get a slice or two, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> I think barbecue. A lot of barbecues, really. Fire up the gas. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm cliche. I'm like prawns on the barbecue and cold beers and you know I don't go too hard I might do the lamb with some anchovy butter but other than that I kind of just go like yeah I go pretty griswold at Christmas so I think even for the barbecues and all that sort of stuff that's kind of where I head. Mm. Sounds like you're a real Christmas person are you wearing a Santa hat while you're at the barbecue? Yes consistently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Danielle have you got oh I'm yes I'm the jolly guy, you know. I'm always into it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and Danielle, jolly good Christmas cooking tips. 
Well, my biggest tips when you're cooking for a group are to not cook too many things that need to be cooked at the last minute. I think when people arrive, that's when things start to get a little chaotic and you're trying to serve everyone a drink and make sure everyone is settled. So I like to make salads that can sit at room temperature. I'll make lots of those. And then if, if you are cooking a ham or you're grilling something or doing that, that that is probably the last thing that needs your attention. And then from there on, you can just take it out, let it rest hang out with your friends and then serve everything up later. Don't don't try to overdo it with things that involve a lot of last minute work. Mm, and that kind of, you know, the, your book, Always Out of Lemon, has so many of those, <laughs> has so many of those, you know, make ahead, um, put out share plate dishes. So I'd, yeah. I'd highly recommend it. You know, that would be my yeah. top tip from from Danielle. Oh, thank you. Buy her book. She can't say it, but I can. Grab, grab, your, grab yourself a copy of Always Out of Lemon. <laughs> Thank um, you, Alex. Yeah, and find <laughs> yeah. you're most welcome and find some dishes that need some smoke trap, smoke deal in there and shred it in. So our next question. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> All about the plug. Uh, Nick, how do you know when your lamb is done when you're cooking it? Um, touch and feel, I guess, is from the easiest way to say it. Um, but I mean, the other one is if you're really worried, you can just get like a metal skewer or a spike, put it in and sort of touch it onto your lip. That's probably the easiest way for us to sort of teach cooks how to teach how to do it. Um, and I'll say that, you know, you're looking for like that sort of 54-ish kind of degree. So just a bit warmer than your lip, you're going to be pretty cool. Um, and cook it from room temperature. So if your lamb's at room temperature, sort of sit on a plate next to the barbecue and then grill it quite hard and then give it a bit of a rest, you're going to be good to go. And if you're really worried, just okay. take a second check it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd, uh, I'd say... Uh, from from room temp and, and, a, and a good rest at the end you're good to go mm, that's a really good tip so not fridge cold to the barbecue that yeah. is definitely the first step yeah. to a really successful cooking of anything really but particularly yeah. meat yeah definitely um next question this one will be for danielle i bet danielle what are your top tips for slow cooking with beef well i mean my tip is to find a certain flavor profile that you want to stick with. So, I mean, I've done something super classic with mirepoix and red wine and of course that little kick of um, vinegar, but you could also go, you know, people associate beef with red wine, but you could raisin white wine. You don't have to brown the meat. That adds flavor, but it's absolutely not necessary. You could keep it really light with just bay leaf, even like some lemon. So you could really take it any direction you want. Um, but you really don't have to do too many steps along the way. If you get some good, high quality beef, um, I do like to season it in advance. I think especially when braising, you can't season it just before you start cooking it because the salt just kind of slides right off. You have to season it at least an hour or two um, or even just like 30 minutes really helps if you're crunched for time. Um, but that helps to get the seasoning in there um, and cool the meat inside the braising liquid. Don't take it out if you're trying to cool it down rapidly, just let it sit, it'll cool down in its own time. Um, you can do things like that ahead, which is also really helpful. So like braise something ahead, let it cool in the liquid in the pot that you have it in, put that in the fridge, and then you can take it out the next day and rewarm it. Um, and it's very forgiving, you know, you'll know it's done when the meat is falling apart. Um, so there's no way to really um, overcook it. I, I don't think, mm. but you can certainly undercook it if the meat is not tender enough. Mm. And it always tastes better the next day anyway, doesn't it? For sure. It, as something sat in that liquid will, will be better the next day, even a couple days out, you can do something like that. Love it. Okay. And our next question, I think this will be our final one. What do you both normally cook when you're at home? Nick, what are you, what are you cooking? What's your favorite thing at the moment? Um, <laughs> it kind of depends really. Like I don't cook at home enough. I would say during lockdown, I went nuts and I cooked everything inside, which kind of like drove my wife <laughs> up the wall. But now it's just like <laughs> lamb leg really on the barbecue. <laughs> That's kind of all the requests are or a bowl of pasta or depends on the night you know like you know if, like to be honest if it's raining i'm always like yep yeah, bolognese and a bottle of red wine sweet you know if it's sunny i'm like right let's do a barbecue <laughs> so kind of whatever mm -hmm. it is like 
whatever the time, whatever's going on is kind of what I cook. Um, mm. Or I just get like the dirty fridge used up, you know, like, oh, there's heaps of stuff in there. You've got to make something out of it, you know, which generally goes through pasta. So anything that's like kind of wholesome and, <laughs> you know, sort of can be eaten on the lounge happily with my wife and the dog and, and we're happy that's sort of it really. Love it. Danielle, what about for you? I mean, very much the same. I'm totally guided by the weather on what I like to eat. So <laughs> if it's really hot outside, I'll go for something more like salad -y and or a piece of fish and some vegetables. But, you know, pasta is always the comfort food that I turn to. And I think as chefs, we're cooking a lot of you know, elaborate food during the week. So it's nice to just be able to cook a bowl of pasta, whether it be bolognese or some vegetables, a little bit of garlic and anchovy, that kind of thing. That That's what I love when I'm cooking at home. That's brilliant. And what a perfect place to finish because that's really what this series has been all about. The Taste Dining at Home series has been our opportunity to chat with top chefs about the stuff that they're cooking at home, the stuff that they're looking forward to cooking in their restaurants. If you've missed an episode, check it all out on the Taste of Sydney website. You can find all the recipes, all the videos and the Q&As. Uh, and remember that, you know, I think the, the, the message and the, the learning that I'm taking away from every single chef that we've spoken to is to keep it simple, cook with the seasons, find great produce and enjoy it with your loved ones. And as we move into the festive season, you know, I'm so grateful to you, Danielle, and to you, Nick, for giving up some of your time to chat with us today. And I hope that all of you at home that, that watched it have enjoyed it as much as I have. And certainly the whole series has been a real joy for me to be a part of. So you know, big ups to the Taste of Sydney crew, uh, to IMG, to Diners Club, to Good Meat, to everybody that's made this possible. Um, and I, I truly hope that all of you have a safe, comfortable and joyful festive season. And I look forward to seeing what 2021 brings for all of us, because it certainly will be better than 2020. From me, Alice Zaslavsky, <laughs> and from our chefs, Danielle and Nick, and from all of us here at the Taste Dining at Home series, I wish you a happy festive season and take care.